London, England. Part of Great Britain, capital city of a former empire that embraced a quarter of the world's population and land area. An empire, they said, upon which the sun never set. But recently it has set, and now it is part of the Commonwealth. Twice this century, Britain has fought in world wars. But the waters that separated this island race from Europe 7,000 years ago have been its great protector. 4,000 miles of coastline have kept it unconquered for almost 1,000 years. No nation, wrote Emerson, was ever so rich in able men. The birthplace of the inventor of the steam engine, the hovercraft, and of the discoverer of electricity, and of the pioneers in the field of atomic research. It's a country in transition, and if you wish to do well in business there, remember that it was the seedbed of the 19th century industrial revolution. It's one of the world's most important financial centers. It remains one of the world's major manufacturing and trading nations. And since Britain's entry into the EEC, the common market, it's the base from which to cover a single market of over 250 million people in the community. This is a country of many contradictions. We shall tell you who the Britons are, where they are, and how you should treat them socially, commercially. From the post office telecommunications tower in the central West End district, Greater London spreads out to embrace a population of almost seven and a half million. The city of Westminster is the center of government. And the city of London, the square mile around the Bank of England and the Stock Exchange, is one of the financial capitals of the world. London straddles the River Thames and is one of the world's largest ports. But do not be misled. London is not England, and England is just one part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. If you want to talk about England, this is England. To this we add Wales. This is Scotland. This is Northern Ireland. 600 miles north to south, 300 miles east to west, and no point is further than 75 miles from tidal water. It's almost the same size as Wyoming. If you're not absolutely certain, do not call anyone an Englishman. He may be from Scotland or Wales or Ireland, and very proud of his separate nationality. Call them all British. This avoids giving offense. They all speak the same language, English, though there are still some areas where Welsh or Gaelic are spoken. They all owe allegiance to one monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, who reigns but does not rule. Parliament in London is the supreme legislative authority. The country is governed in the name of the sovereign by a body of ministers and the cabinet, who are leading members of the party in office. They are responsible to Parliament, and there are two houses. The House of Commons is democratically elected. Elections are held at least once every five years, and the majority party forms the government. My lords and members of the House of Commons, I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your council. The House of Lords. This is the second chamber. It has very restricted powers and has both hereditary members and life peers appointed by the Queen on the advice of the Prime Minister. But the real power lies with the House of Commons and the Cabinet. There is a large permanent civil service who staff the government departments irrespective of the party in power. Throughout the world, Britain has embassies and consulates with commercial councillors who give you help in planning your visit. Go to them as early as you can, and they will be a valuable source of information about your future business contacts. Many large firms buy direct from overseas suppliers, while smaller firms find it more convenient to deal through import-export houses, commission agents, and the representatives of overseas firms. As to regulations or restrictions or tariffs on imports or exports, find out from your local embassy or consulate before you go. Afterwards may be expensive or too late. In Britain, the Department of Trade and Industry deals with every kind of trade in every territory and with import regulations. Your own government will help with explanations of local tastes and preferences, methods of trading and commercial standing of firms with whom you hope to do business. Britain has one of the most highly developed banking and financial systems in the world. 
In the city of London, with the Bank of England at their head, are the great commercial banks and clearing houses and the offices of almost 170 overseas foreign banks. Specialized markets provide finance on various terms. The foreign exchange market, commodity markets and insurance are all equally available. Your own bank will certainly have arrangements with a British bank. So get to know who to contact should you need finance in Britain or get them to arrange it for you. There's a popular myth that most business in Britain is dominated by tradition and is conducted by gentlemen in bowler hats behind oak paneled doors in a genteel manner. Modern British business is characterized much more today by its flexibility. Meetings can be held at any place, any time. There is more formality in British business life than in North America, but not as much as in continental Europe. Most executives appreciate at least one month's notice to make an appointment. And it's the custom to fix a particular time on a particular day, not merely one day in any week. Be precise, they like it. Usually an hour will be the time allotted, but if you need more, do say so in fixing the appointment. The British like to be on time. Ten o'clock is ten o'clock and not a quarter of an hour later.